Okay. So what what we are going to do today is actually to uh, start addressing some little bit more complex problem uh, using Python. The idea is that uh, starting from this lesson uh, and for the next, I think, three lesson of uh, this kind, we will uh, tackle uh, increasing difficulty exercises uh, done by using the Python language and by tackling different aspects, uh, starting from pure software today and uh, going up to uh, full automation in the uh, last uh, lesson about Python plus anything else. Okay, so the idea is to provide you some examples, some instruments for uh, uh, developing uh, in an autonomous way and to start tackling your projects directly. Okay, so today basically we program. We have some uh, exercises to accomplish and we try to analyze the problem and to solve it. And, uh, and the idea is that also the exercises in the lab are going to become uh, uh, more and more difficult <laughs> so that you will uh, be quickly uh, able to start tackling the real project, okay? So we leave uh, uh, the usual uh, number-based exercises, just count all the numbers from and so on. The one that we did uh, on Monday, basically, and we start doing something more practical, okay? So let's start from the, the simplest exercise of today. Uh, I brought with me the code just to make sure of, making, of avoiding to make any error, okay? Uh, but anyway, I've written the code, it's here. <laughs> and so first exercise is really simple, but already somewhat related to, uh, to some hardware information that we may want to extract from the machine on which we are running the program. Today we are going to run the program directly on my PC and if you are following also on your PC, okay? But uh, the libraries and the functions that we use uh, can be run also on the Raspberry Pi or on similar platforms. So it's mainly for a logistic uh, concern that I didn't bring, brought with me uh, the PI because it needs cabling and so on. And especially because today we use some internet service uh, so uh, I need also to provide connectivity to the PI, which is not exactly direct here uh, in, this, uh, um, in this setup, basically, okay? While in the lab, we will have uh, public IPs, so no problem for having internet access also for the PIs. Okay, um, so first exercise. This is really simple. The idea is to extract some uh, operating system metrics by using Python. Basically, just to check, for example, the current load average of the machine, which operating system is running uh, with the version, name, architecture, uh, kernel, and the total and the free memory available when we run the program, basically. And to perform this exercise, we perform also some assumption, which will simplify our work. So the first assumption is that we are working on a Unix Linux system. Okay, uh, this is mainly because uh, in the future we will be working on the PI and that will uh, be running a Debian Linux version. And secondly, because this allows us to exploit some operating system facility that are not available for Windows-based platforms. Okay, so it's a simplifying assumption. And the second suggestion that we have, we can exploit uh, a specific module in Python, which is named OS from operating system, that provides some facility for accessing the operating system functionalities, okay? So this is the general structure. In the next lab, you will have a structure very similar to this kind of exercises, where you have uh, uh, the text to follow, the, the requirements, basically, and some suggestion on uh, what tools you can employ for solving the exercise, okay? And then afterwards, you need just to check the documentation check the internet, whatever you need for getting the result uh, which is required. So let's start with this. Uh, let's start analyzing the problem, which, which is quite simple, uh, actually. And uh, let's try to focus how can we solve this problem uh, with these assumptions. 
Okay. Um, first thing to to understand is how can we get the information we need? Okay. So the first thing we need to do is to understand uh, what kind of functionality uh, the US module provides and what are the typical commands that we run on a Linux machine to get this information. So for example, if you want to get information about the memory on the machine directly from the operating system, what we can do is to open a terminal and type Yeah, I think so. Let me check. Let me just find the right. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, so if I type this Linux command, which is uh, cat slash proc slash meminfo, I get all the information about the memory of my system. Okay, this is an operating system command. I just check the current status. And I got several data, several data about my memory usage. But for example, I can read the total memory or the total free memory. This is my be more readable. Okay. So my system has six uh, gigabytes of memory in total and around four mega, four gigabytes free. Okay. And this is, these are the two information we want to get from Python and we want to print out, basically. Okay. Other information I can get from the terminal, for example, is which kind of system is running my PC. If I type uname minus hey, I get that my machine is a Linux machine. The host name is calypso.polito.it. And it is running an OpenSUSE desktop with the kernel uh, 3.11.10. And it is a 64-bit machine. Okay. So this is, these are information we can get from the operating system directly. We, need, we just need to find a way for calling these tools from Python. So our, the solution to our program will be basically to understand how we can run these commands from Python, or we can wrap this command with the Python module. Okay. So it's quite simple. No, no algorithm. Basically, we just call a list of commands one after the other. Okay. But the idea is to start employing some module which is not just the default one. Okay, so let's start developing the program. We can create a new Python module. We name it, for example, OS metrics. And we start by selecting the main template. Um, this is really important. Actually, until now, we um, avoided to explain why uh, Eclipse offered the option to, to start uh, the, the program development by uh, using this template. And also, we avoid to mention what, what this template means. Okay. Now, it's really important to understand it. Uh, this two instruction, basically just the first, the if name equal main, are used to avoid running the script when importing the script as a module. Whenever we use a, an external module in Python, we type an instruction, like the one I'm going to type now, for using the OS module, which is import OS. Okay? That tells to the Python interpreter that we are going to use all the functions which are defined into the OS module. A module is basically, in its basic version, it's just a file. It's, it's a script with functions inside. Okay? You know what a function is, because you already tried to develop some functions. Well, uh, 
if we want to import a module and we don't want to execute directly the script inside the module, we should make sure that all the executable part, all the scripts are inside a clause starting with that if. Because otherwise, if I, if I just type the script, for example, I just type print whatever, when I import my module, that part will be executed directly. Okay? So the difference is that whenever we want to use a module, a script as a module, we need to make sure that there is no script code that can be ex executed by just calling import. And this avoids it. Because the function are not naturally called, they are just there for providing their functions. While all the code that is, that is not inside the function should be inside this clause to avoid that code to be run. Okay, what the pass means? Nothing. It means absolutely nothing. It, it is just a placeholder, okay? Pass the execution means actually. So what we are going to do is to replace that passing instruction with our script, exactly as if we were directly writing the script down. Um, and in this case, we just write a script. We don't define any function, but we just use functions defined in the US module, okay? So let's start with the first requirements. For example, we uh, typed uname minus a on the terminal for getting the information about uh, the kind of operating system uh, I'm running on my machine. We want to do the same, possibly avoiding to directly call the command, but for example, by using a function defined in this module. Okay. So, let's start. And let's start also to get used to comments, because actually, when we, you develop a script, it's a, a good thing to try to have one comment, one line of code, basically, as a frequency, so that every line is explained and everyone looking at the code is uh, able to understand what the code does without uh, understanding the code by itself. Okay, so first we get the operating system information. Okay, let me... I know that you can't read this because it's a uh, light gray. Okay, I'm just telling to you what I'm writing. But the next will be black. <laughs> okay, so comments are gray in Eclipse. Uh, I can change the color, but actually they, don't, they do not matter too much for the lesson. Okay, let's get the uname information. How can we do that? First, let's declare a variable called uname, for example. And let's use the OS module for calling the uname command. How can we do that? We can start from OS, type dot, and we get the list of all the functions included in this module. And then we can start peering inside and looking for a uname-like function. Actually, if we peer, we find exactly a function named uname, which is here, uname. And if I click on your name, I got also the explanation here on the right that says, return a tuple, identify the current operating system. So exactly the same function of the uname command. Okay, that's why before starting to develop in Python, I try to show to you the uname command and the other ones because they have a direct correspondence in this library, basically. Okay, and what the uname function returns is a tuple. Okay, you remember what a tuple is in Python. It's a set of values, okay? So the values we need will be uh, inside this tuple, and we, need to, we will need to extract the information we want from the tuple, okay? So let's first uh, try to get the tuple and just print it on the screen to see what happens. So we call uname, and then I just comment this line by saying debug which is just for showing what happens, and I print your name, okay? Just to check which are the contents of the tuple. Then let's save it and run 
the program. Okay, and what you see is actually the same information we get with the uname command. So this is a Linux machine. The name is calypso.polito.it. The kernel is a 3.11, and with this version, single machine, single multiprocessor, preemptive, and so on. And the architecture is a 64 bits. Okay. Then, uh, what if we want to print a little bit better this information? What we need to do is basically to access the information in the tuple and format it using the string formatter characters. Okay, the one that we already know, basically. So let's try to do that. So here, instead of just printing your name, we try to format uh, the information we print. So for example, we can print here um, operating system type equal, and that would be a string, okay? So percent s. Then let's go down one line, slash n, backslash n, sorry. And we can also provide the host name. So for example, we can type host, and it will also be a string. And then we can uh, write the kernel information and the architecture. So we, we type exactly the same information in just in a pretty way, let's say. Okay, so uh, kernel and uh, architecture. And this will be, okay. Now what we need is to provide the information to fill uh, the placeholders, basically. So we add a person sign, and then we provide a list of values to fill the placeholder. If we directly provide the tuple, actually it works, but it only works if the number of parameters inside the string formatting are exactly the, equal to the number of fields in the tuple. In this case, we are going to concatenate two fields in just one line, which is the one of the kernel. So we cannot directly use the, type, the tuple. We need to access the element of the tuple. Um, might be, <laughs> or not. What do you think? Okay, I said, we need to have exactly the same parameters, the same placeholder in the string format, uh, the same number of the fields inside the tuple. How many fields we have inside the tuple? Okay, let's go back to the first output we had. One, two, three, four, and five, okay? And I said, I just want to concatenate the strings corresponding, describing the kernel, which are this one, okay, and this one. So, can I just use your name here, so the tuple as it is, or not? I can, exactly, but if I want to use it, I need to do exactly what I did, what I tell you that I will do. So I need to write two string parameters for concatenating the two values about the current. So here I just need to put another placeholder. In this case, I will get exactly five placeholders for five fields, okay? If I didn't do that, I would have to get each single field from the uname because I, I needed to map some field and only some field, not all the fields of the uname uh, tuple. So, okay. Let's try to print it now. And here we got the same output in a, printed in a better way. So we got the S type, the host, then the two parameters 
about the kernel and the architecture. Okay. And you see in this case it, it's quite easy to, to print the tuple because actually we don't do any uh, computation on that. We just get all the values. Okay. Then what if uh, we want to go over and we want to fulfill the other uh, request of our exercise, which was printing the current load average. So how much loaded is my machine? We didn't see any line command, any console command for looking at this information. Actually, actually there is one, which is, um, for example. Top is providing monitoring on the current status of my machine. And if you see here the first line, sorry, the first line is load average 0 0.0, 0 0.05, 0 0.40. Okay. This is basically the load percentage averaged over increasing amount of time. 5 minutes, 10 minutes, uh, 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, if I'm not right, if I'm not wrong, okay? Now, we want to get the same information in Python. Well, let's check if there is something similar uh, inside the US module, okay? So, let's go down one line and print here, get the load average. And we, so let's check under the US library. And actually there is another function, which is exactly, I think the uh, get load average or something like that, let me check. Get load average here, okay? Get load average returns the number of processes in the system, run queue, average over the last one, five, and 15 minutes. Okay, exactly the same information provided by the top command. Okay, and also in this case, the function returns a tuple composed by three floating point values. Okay, so let's get the load average information. Let's store this information into a variable. Okay, and let's do exactly the same we did for printing the kernel information, okay? So we exploit the entire set of information inside the tuple, so we just use the tuple as parameter, and we can print here, for example, um, oh, sorry for the average. And right here, uh, it said, let me check. One, five and 15 minutes. So, one minute. And then, five minutes, and then, for example, 15 minutes, okay? So, just pretty printing, and here we provide load average, okay? Then, let's run this. Okay, one error. Not, uh, not all arguments converted during string formatting. Okay, why? Could you see the error? Yeah, that is one problem, but actually there is one bigger problem. I just forgot one placeholder. So exactly this error, forgive me about 
inserting the error, but it's important to understand the messages from the uh, interpreter. The message is saying, not all arguments. Okay, so there is a mismatch between the number of parameters and the number of placeholder. Okay, that, that's the first error. So if I put here, percent s, and run it another time, it works. Because basically I'm telling to the interpreter, okay, now format as a string these numbers. Okay. But finally the right, the right format will be using f instead of s. That tells to the string format that these are floating point numbers. Okay. And you see the difference. These are floating point numbers. Okay, what if we want to insert, a, sorry, I need to use this. Uh, what if we want to insert a tab, a, a four characters space to ident the values with respect to the label? Slash t. exactly. So what I need to put here is slash t. Okay, and we get identification. Okay, so that she means tab. Okay, then last question we need to answer is to get the total memory and the available memory. But unfortunately, this cannot be done directly using the US module. Okay, but we remember it from the operating system. We can just type cat slash proch slash uh, meminfo, okay? So we can require the OS module to perform exactly this command, okay? So we can say the memory information will be OS dot system, and here we will write the command. Okay, so here we are telling to the OS, OS module, please execute this system command. But what happens if we just do this? The command gets executed, but we don't get back the result of the command. Because the result goes on the console, exactly as if I run the command directly from the console. So what we need is to capture the console for reading the result, for reading the output of this command. And how can we capture the console? If we were directly on the console, and for example, we want to print this information on the file, what we will do is to, or just to read it slowly, what we can do is to call the command, so cat slash, sorry. Arrow slash info. And then we can pipe it. That's the name of the symbol pipe onto, for example, less. And you see what happens. Less, which is another command that reads text file, basically captures the output of the cat command and works on the output. So it provides, for example, line by line interaction. So I can do up and down on the command. And I can do this because I piped the output of the cat command to the input of the less command. Okay? And I can do the same in Python. I can pipe the output of a command to a file. And I treat the output of the command as a file, as a normal file. So what I can do here is to pipe it. So right here, um, instead of system pipe, p open, open a pipe on the common, on the output, the common. This will generate a file 
How can we read a text file? By just calling read. So dot read. Okay, same principle. Run the command, capture the output, and handle the output as a file. At this point, inside memory, we will get exactly the same information we get on the console. So if we just print it for debugging, you can, okay, let me write here the comment. So, here we can print debug, and if I just print memory, okay, I get the result. Let's try to see if it works. Okay, let me. Um, go back on the development part, run it, expand, and you see here, we just printed the output of the cat command, okay? Because we captured it. Now that we have captured the, the output, what we need to do is to perform some string manipulation for cutting out all the information but the total memory and the free memory. But this is a string. It is rather easy to get that information. How can we do that? First, let's proceed by steps. First thing, this is a, a whole string. What we need to get is just the first two lines of this string. So let's split the string along lines. So that we get an array of strings where each element is composed by one line, okay? So to do that, what we can do is to take memory and split memory on new lines, okay? That will be memory dot split on new lines, okay? And this will provide back, let's have a look at the manual, if it works. Okay. It, it, it doesn't show the manual, but we know that this is a basically an array. Okay, so we can store the array and we can access each line by accessing the element of the array. So let's call this memory Tuple, okay. or memory array, if you like it. They are almost the same. Okay. And now if I print, instead of memory, just memory array, we will see that every line has been put inside an element, a different element of the array. So if I just type memory array, okay, save and run. You see here every line. Uh, let me expand the console. So I got mem total, then the next element will be mem free, and so on and so on. Now it's really easy to start accessing only the total and the free memory because they are the elements in position zero and one. But what we need, want also to do is to just get the value. We don't want to print, or maybe we want, but. Let's assume that we don't want to print mem total because, for example, we want to print by ourselves total memory. Okay, so we want to strip out that part. To do that, we can proceed in the same way. In this case, we split on spaces, we replace initial spaces and uh, so trailing and leading spaces on the second part, on the number part, and we print it. Okay. Okay, so this can be done in this way. So let's try to write the instruction for reading the first information, then we just duplicate it for the next one. So we want to print total memory.
okay? And we want to get this information from the memory array. That means we need to first get the first element. In position zero, okay? Right, first line, first item. Then we split the array along the best choice is to use a column, which is exactly the separator from the legend, let's say, and the value. We get, in this case, another array where the second element is the number, OK? So let's access the second element. And let's strip everything. Let's strip the leading spaces. So we just call strip, OK? We are building a complex expression for doing just one simple thing. OK, now if it works, we should have the first line here saying total memory, the value of the total memory, OK? Then let me comment the, the subsequent line just to avoid cluttering the screen. OK, we save it, we run, and that's it. Okay, we got exactly the total memory. Okay, so the principle here was to split the string, split another time one of the items of the string, and then cut out all the spaces. Okay. It can be done in different ways. This is just one of the possible ways. Okay. So for performing the same operation on the free memory, it's a really easy, we just need to change the index of the first array from zero to one for getting the second element. So I can just copy this and replace total with three and replace zero with one. In this case, I get the second element. And if I print it, this is the result. OK? And this also hands our exercise, OK? Because we provided all the answer, all the required information. But before closing it, what if we want to make this set of instruction available as a function? So that we call this function, for example, system metrics or print system metrics, since we just showed the operation. What we need to do is to define a function and to call it. So if we want to define, to group all these instruction in a function, we just need to define the function here. So define function name. Let's call it uh, print system metrics. OK, we don't need any parameter because we just query the system and print out some information. And then afterwards, what we need to do is to cut all the code and paste it inside the function body. So we go down here, cut the code, put it here. OK. Oh, sorry, too high. Here. OK? And in this way, we have defined a function. What if we want to run to see the output? OK, let's do another in another way. First, we run our script now. We expect to see nothing, because there's nothing inside the main part. OK? OK. Actually, there's an identification error. here. <laughs> okay, because it is waiting for something inside the main part, but there is nothing, okay? So, let's call the function here. Uh, and the function is print sysmetrics, okay? Let's save it. And we got it, okay? 
So we got the same result, but in this case, since I said at the beginning that actually a script that can be used as a module, okay, if I write in another file, import OS metrics, and then type OS metrics dot print sys metrics, I can use the function. So this is uh, the procedure for use code, basically. When we have something that can be reused outside of our module, it is better to uh, enclose it inside a function, which can be exported. OK, so this was the first exercise. Let's try to do something a little bit more exciting, just a little bit more. Text to speech. OK, don't worry. What we want to do now is to write a program that takes some text on the console and speaks it aloud. Okay. And you may think that this is a, a very big step to accomplish. Actually, it's exactly the same. Okay. Why? Because we are using a trick, of course. There is one service provided by Google and not a really documented. It's a kind of hidden service that, given a string, provides an MP3 file with the string pronunciation. So if I get this string, which is here in the suggestion, and I try to type it on the browser, I get exactly, oh, let me exit one second and copy the string. And if I go here, Oh, let me raise up. Let's see if I can. Hello. Okay. And if I change this and I write, how are you? I get. Hello. Oh, sorry. How are you? Okay. Okay. So really easy. Actually, what I need to do is to call a URL. Okay. Nothing really difficult. But I can do it by using an operating system command. In particular, there is one program in the operating system which is called wget. Let's type minus minus help to get the help information. And what does wget, which has a couple of options, it is to basically retrieve a web page. That's exactly what we need. We need to require to retrieve the MP3 file generated by calling that URL, the same which is played inside the browser. And after retrieving that file, what we need to do is to play it. How can we play it? There's another program on the system. That's why we were assuming that we were on, li on Linux and not on Windows. Which is called mPlayer. Ah, okay. Which basically, it's a music player. It's a music and video player on the command line. So, our solution will be, okay, we found that we just call a URL and we get back the pronunciation. The pronunciation is an MP3 file. We have a program for downloading this MP3 file, which is wget. Then what we need to do for speaking is to play the file. And we have a player, which is mplayer. So our Python script will just get the text from the console, add the text to the URL, get the MP3, and play the MP3, okay? So, one step after the other. This is the design process. We are splitting the problem in very simple steps, okay? So, let's write another file here. Let's call it TTS text-to-speech, 
with our main part. And just for avoiding forgetting any command line parameters, we need to prepare first a function for speeching, okay? For speaking, sorry. For generating the speech. Secondly, we need to address the requirement that was speak the words typed by the user until the user types exit. In that case, say goodbye and exit. Okay? So there are two parts. First, speaking. Second, handling the user input. Let's take a speaking. We can define a function, say, which takes as a parameter a text. In this way, we can reuse this function wherever we need to generate a speech from a text. OK. So first, we said that we want to get the MP3 file by calling wget. So let's prepare the command that we need to issue to the system for getting back the MP3 file. And we can, OK, let's right here prepare uh, the wget command. And here we can say that wget line, it's a string, and it will be wget. Then these are the parameters we need to use. I don't require you to learn them, but you can just check the help and understand that these are the, the required. I, I'm just explaining what they are, um, apart from something. Minus Q, let's ignore it. Minus U means user agent. We are acting as a browser. So we tell to Google that we are the Mozilla browser. Okay? We are not being WGET. We are a Mozilla Firefox web browser. Then we also tell to WGET that we want to save the file and call it, for example, test.mp3. Okay, and finally, we need to provide a URL. The URL in the wget command must be enclosed inside quotes. And here we got the first problem, because we used quotes for the limit in the string. So how can we use quotes inside the string? Exactly, by escaping the quotes. So, backslash quote. Then, the URL, which is, let me copy it because I don't remember it. It is translate dot dot com slash translate underscore TTS. Then, okay, we need to pass the string encoding. DFH and the TL parameter is the language, which for us is English. Okay, EN that stands for English. And then we will have the query, the text that we want to speak. The text is the same parameter that we have for the function, say text. Okay, so let's concatenate this string with text for composing the URL. So in this case, we just close the quotes. Let me, maybe this is a little bit more readable. Close the quotes, some text, and then again, complete the command. Okay, so this quotes Backslash quotes, quotes means uh, add the ending quote at the uh, URL so that wget is able to call uh, the URL correctly and to get back the file. So this very long line, actually it is not so long, but the character is enlarged for making you <laughs> see the character, okay? So don't be scared, it is not so long. Okay, what I did forget. Okay, I forget some quote probably here. Okay. 
That's it. Now we got the wget command. How can we call the command? We already know. We use the OS module. So if we need to use the OS module, we need to import it. So here, import OS. And then here we can just type call wget. That means OS dot system. wget line. OK? So we just compose the string that represented the get command and rerun it. After doing this, inside our the same directory in which we execute the script, we will have an MP3 file called test. So what we need to do that after this is to just require MP player to play the MP3. Okay. So require M player to play test dot mp3 as a comment. So it will be OS dot system. What's the command? The command is M player, a couple of options. Minus quiet means do not write anything on the console because we are calling it from a script, so we don't need the console. Do not use the ERC chat system. We don't want to chat with anyone. Then we will tell you, uh, tell, uh, sorry, tell to MP player to avoid outputting any function and information, OK? So usually it debugs. It, it prints some debug information at different levels, errors, warnings. We don't want anything, because we are just calling it from the script. And after this, we provide the name of the file to play, test.mp, sorry, test.mp3, OK? Now. If it works, because it might not work, if, but if it works, we can just call say with the text and listen to the result. So, so let's write here, say, hello world. OK? Save it. and try to play it. And nothing works. OK? So there might be some problem. Might be also it's just the audio system. Let's check if we get the test mp3 file here. So this is inside in class. OK. Um, OK, let me. We got the test mp3 file, but actually it's empty. So in this moment, we didn't receive any information from the Google service. OK? So that's the problem. Maybe we just type wrongly the command line. So let's try it. OK? So we get this. You try? Nothing happens. Are you sure? 
okay it isn't just to make sure that it works uh, it is here this is the the version that you will have as a solution hello world okay so we are missing the command line. That's why I was so sure. <laughs> okay, so let's try from the command line. So wget minus q minus u. Okay, need to change this one. Here we need to put. Uh, Q equal to hello. Let's put the plus here, but it's the same. Hello world. Okay. Let's run it. And now we get it. So we have probably, probably, some problem on the quotes around the URL because it's the only difference uh, if you look at the command that I issued is just with the quotes correctly placed otherwise I copied everything so let's go back here let's use this trick since we just use quotes for the wget command let's delimit the string using single quote so that we are sure that it works Okay. Oh, sorry, the wrong one. Nothing. What is okay? What I'm missing? That you get minus Q and minus here. Okay, you should be working. <laughs> minus Q minus U. Translate dot Google dot com. Translate yes. TL equal EN. Okay, yes. I forgot the Q here. <laughs> okay. Sorry. For, probably. But not, not so sure. E and Q equals. Hello, world. Yeah, we got it. OK. So the problem was on the URL. Okay. This is debugging, hard debugging. Okay. Why? Because in this case, we don't have the error inside the Python code, in a sense. The error is in the command line we use. OK. OK. Now that we got the baseline working, what we need to do is to handle the um, user input so that we can continue asking for new words and pronouncing the words until the user writes exit. In that case, we say goodbye and we close the program. Okay, this is easier because what we need to do is to loop until the string that we get from the console is equal to exit. In that case, we just say goodbye. So first, let's define a string, empty. OK? Then, OK. Let's start cycling until the string contains exit. String equals to exit. Not equal. Okay. Then we ask to the user for entering some word, some text. So it it is just a string 
equal to pro input and then we prompt the user insert some word please okay then if the string is equal to exit we break the loop but before breaking the loop and this is done by the condition inside the while instruction what we want to do is to consume the exit string and substitute that string with goodbye for saying goodbye okay so here we just check the string content and we said that if string is equal to exit then we say goodbye okay otherwise we say string okay now let's write and let's remember the comment of you that was telling uh, spaces should be replaced by a plus okay because I was also in this case not telling you the truth okay here we need a column also let's run it insert some word hello hello okay How are you? How are you? Okay. Okay. Basic English course. Fine, and you? Okay, and so on and so on. If we want to exactly be, um, to exactly respect what's the standard for composing the URLs, actually we need to replace the spaces with a plus. And actually, we need to escape all the forbidden characters with the right ones. Okay, so this works actually because the Google service is doing that. Okay, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> that's why. What if we type exit? Goodbye. And it stops. Okay. So what we have generated is a simple text-to-speech system with a function that given a, whatever string pronounces the string in uh, three lines. One, two, and three. Okay? That's really easy. Okay, so next step. Let's try to mix the two exercises together. First, in the exercise, in the first exercise, we get some system metrics in a system dependent way because we called commands on the console. Okay. We can do the same by using a library, a module. And in this way, since that module is actually portable between systems, we can do the same operation on different operating systems first step second step let's try to uh, we won't be able to do it actually because it's late but the second step would be to check the current usage of the CPU and if the percentage trepasses a given threshold we will say warning the CPU is over 10% okay Let's try to skip the first one, which is annoying, uh, and to implement the second one, <laughs> okay? Because we have very few minutes for that. Uh, all the solutions are already online on GitHub, so that you can just connect to the address of the repository and download it. Um, let's create a new module. Let's call it uh, metrics. Oh, sorry, not here. main okay 
And let's define our monitoring function. Left CPU monitor. And we pass basically a threshold, an interval for checking, and um, let's say just the threshold and interval. OK. We want to get the CPU percentage. How can we do that? There's one module that you can find by looking at the Python documentation. This is not because I know them, because I, I just searched them. This imp and the name is psutil. So import psutil. OK? And this psutil provides uh, CPU, if, CPU person, well, really easy. CPU person returns a float representing the current system-wide CPU utilization as a percentage. If I don't pass the per, if I don't pass true for the per CPU parameter, I will get the global percentage. Otherwise, it will be divided for each CPU in the system. So we just need the global value. So let's call it. CPU person, and we can call it without parameters because they have default. OK, and this is the percentage. OK, then we want to check if they are, if this is over threshold. So if percentage is greater than threshold. OK, uh, colon. What we do is to say, warning, say, we already written the code. So let's import our module. So here we just import TTS and we say, warning, the CPU is over. slash f person OK? At TTS, sorry, TTS dot say. OK? In this case, we are using the same method, we define the same function we defined in the previous script. Now, what if we want to check this continuously? Okay, because otherwise it, either the threshold is really low or we are very lucky when we check, when we run the program. Okay, this can be done by cycling forever, which is not usually a good programming choice, but in this case, it might work. Okay. And since we don't do uh, we don't want to get the CPU at 100% for all time. We should be polite. So after checking, wait for some interval and then restart. So we need to wait how much this interval parameter. But for waiting, we need another module, which is called time. And here we can put time.sleep. For example, one second. So we check the CPU. If the CPU is under the threshold, we just wait for one second and recheck the CPU. OK, so let's experiment with this. Here, we just need to call our function. So CPU monitor. And let's put a low threshold, OK, 10 person. And oh, sorry, this was interval. And this and one should be put here. OK? Let's try to run it. Then, if it works, I just need to make the CPU raise over 10%. If it works. Warning the CPU is over 12.10000. <laughs> OK? 
because I didn't format the string. So there were four zeros. That's why I wrote one. OK? But it works. OK. I think that for today we can stop because the, it's 7 o'clock. Um, you see that we can build up on our previous work. OK. <laughs> OK, you find both the text and the solution of the following exercises. Maybe we can see them uh, in the next lesson. I don't know. Otherwise, you can try to, to have a look at them because they have a quite uh, reachable level. Apart the last one, which is one of the most interesting, I can just show you the last one because it's, I think it's funny, but it depends on judgments. If we run this, OK. OK, this software is made by composing all the building blocks we already have produced, plus one, and basically checks one email account for new messages and tell me that there are new messages. So if I open a client and I send an email to the account, which is the one of Todd, and saying, hello, this is a new email in the subject. The script that you have in the solution basically reads the new mails. If there are new mails, tells you that there are new mails, and just reads the sender and the title. So if I send it. There is one new message. Message one. You've got a new message from Dario Bonino, dario.bonino at gmail.com, with subject, hello, this is a new email. OK. And you will see in the solution that there are very few lines more than the one that we just written. OK. OK, that's it. <laughs>